Today, we're gonna keep the nervous system train rolling and get into some physiology. We're talking action potentials and synapses and neurotransmitters, and we're finally gonna answer that counterintuitive question, just how electric is our body's electrical system? Big picture, the nervous system gets its electric label because it transmits something called action potentials. And whether you wanna call that a signal or an impulse, action potentials are the electric part. Action potentials aren't exclusive to the nervous system. Like the pacemaker cells of the heart also make action potentials. It's a similar electrical impulse that's responsible for that classic ECG waveform. Either way, these things don't start out as like a lightning bolt in your brain. They start out as chemicals. So let's get real zoomed in here. There are plenty of individual chemicals in and around the neuron, but we only care about three right now. Sodium and potassium, which are positively charged ions, and chloride, which is a negatively charged ion. At rest, before any action potential starts, there are more sodium ions outside the neuron than inside the neuron, vice versa for potassium. And the membrane isn't like a super exclusive gatekeeper. Potassium actually seeps through really easily while some sodium gets through too but not nearly as much as potassium. So there are some of each ion on both sides of the membrane, but at rest, this is the general pattern we see. This is what's called a concentration gradient. There's a difference in concentrations for each of these ions across the membrane. Now, this is where electricity and this graph come in. Look familiar? It's because every teacher loves to quiz on it, so we're gonna explain it too. You're welcome ahead of time. But what are you actually looking at? The y-axis is the membrane potential. It's a voltage, which means the difference in charge between two points. At any given point on this graph, we're looking at how much more positive or how much more negative each side of the cell membrane is from the other. So if the outside of the membrane is very positive and the inside is very negative, that's a big voltage. Meanwhile, the x-axis is time. And while there's some variation depending on which source you read, we're talking units of milliseconds here, super fast. So if we apply this to the resting membrane potential, the graph starts out super negative since there were all those positive ions outside the cell and very few inside the cell. On the other hand, the inside of this cell would be more positive. Look at all those positively charged ions inside the cell. Okay, I think we got enough background that we're gonna understand action potential. So let's say a little neurotransmitter comes out, it's an excitatory neurotransmitter, it goes up to the dendrite and it's like, hey, wake up. That allows loads of positive ions into the neuron. So now the inside of our cell is getting more positive and our graph ticks up. And if it gets up to negative 55 millivolts, we cross the threshold of excitation, where the axon hillock throws its sodium channels open. This is because those particular channels are voltage-gated channels. They literally open with voltage. But as we'll see in other videos, not every channel opens with voltage. So now all of a sudden, these positive sodium ions rush in and more positive ions inside the cell means our graph goes up as well. This usually tops out around positive 30 or 40 millivolts. This part of the action potential, that crossing of the threshold and positive shoot up or depolarization is all or nothing. If the voltage wiggles between negative 70 and negative 56 millivolts, no depolarization. So after that action potential kicks off, a bunch of voltage gated channels open up all along the axon and in the period of less than a millisecond, an action potential went from soma to terminals. And at the peak of that action potential, the sodium channels close and potassium channels open. This is repolarization. And on our graph, this looks like a sharp drop in the membrane potential since the bulk of positive ions is exiting the cell and the inside of our cell is starting to become more negative again. Quick aside, students get depolarization and repolarization mixed up all the time. So I like to think of the negative part of this graph as like the South Pole. And when we're going away from it, we're depolarizing. But then when we go back down, we're repolarizing. We're going back to the pole. Now, during repolarization, those sodium channels will not open. And if you can't get sodium into the cell, you won't get that concentration gradient, so no action potential. This is called the refractory period, where you could not stoke another action potential no matter how big of a stimulus you had. And while sodium is slipping out, a few more potassium ions are slipping out as well. This creates something called hyperpolarization, since the voltage ends up more negative than when we started. This makes for that dip below baseline we see on the graph. Okay, deep breath in, deep breath out. 
we're almost done. Now, all that's to say is that we took a message from the dendrites down the axon, and now we gotta do something with it. Luckily, at the end of the axon are those axon terminals, and they butt up against other types of cells in something called synapses. And there are two types of synapses. Electrical synapses, or what we call gap junctions, and chemical synapses. Electrical synapses are easy. Really tiny gaps between each synaptic membrane let ions through that make for super fast signaling. On the other hand, chemical synapses are trickier, so we're gonna go more in depth on those. Okay. Quick lay of the land here. Within the synapse, we've got the axon terminal releasing those neurotransmitters to a dendrite or gland or muscle, and in between them is the synaptic cleft, that dead space there. Because that receiver can be a few things, we end up labeling those surfaces the presynaptic membrane and postsynaptic membrane. For this video, we're gonna assume they're both neurons. So when the action potential gets to the end of the line, it triggers those little containers called synaptic vesicles, little pockets wrapped in membranes that hold chemicals called neurotransmitters, each of which can signal for something different. These things are made from all kinds of different chemicals and amino acids. And as of 2019, we know of more than 200 of them. You've heard of the mainstream ones like serotonin or dopamine, but everyone knows you're not a true anatomy student until you got an underground favorite like GABA or glutamate. You gotta be a neurotransmitter hipster. Point is, there's a bunch to pick from. When the action potential gets to the terminal, it shoves those vesicles to the edge of the membrane and pushes that pocket of neurotransmitters out. And because each of those neurotransmitters has a unique shape, they fit into unique receptors on the postsynaptic membrane, like a lock and key. So neurotransmitters get released, float through a super tiny space, and land on the postsynaptic membrane. It can excite the neuron and get it to do something, send an action potential, or it can inhibit the neuron and get it to chill for a second. From there, the process of action potential and synaptic transmission can happen all over again. And this is happening all over your body. Right, if we're talking about the brain, we got something on the order of 100 trillion synapses to work with, but it's way less dense in places like muscles. And that interaction between muscles and nerves ends up being an entire beast in itself. I made a video about it, which you can find out right here. Otherwise, I got a playlist of other nervous system topics, which you can find right here. And a big shout out goes to my patrons on Patreon, Diana and Jessica. If you wanna join them, click this link. Otherwise, subscribe, like the video, have fun, be good. Thanks for watching.